Uh, hi, I'm Alex Roger, and I'm the writer, producer, director of Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie. My name is Richard Wiseman. I was the archive consultant to Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie. My Twitter handle is at Archive Anorak, and there is a reason for that. The ingredients were all there. Dangerous and dramatic source material would give the film legitimacy. The glamour and excitement of the swinging 60s would provide the perfect backdrop. Surely this would be a guaranteed Hollywood hit. It was to be called Day of the Champion. Somehow or other, there was a magic about the 60s. Carnaby Street was there, sex was safe, motor racing was dangerous. It was glamorous, it was colorful, it was exciting. And everybody would come to Monaco every year. Uh, it, it was a special time because Princess Grace was like a magnet to Hollywood, so all the big stars would come as well. It's just a different culture altogether. I just feel so fortunate that I was living in that window. Well, Steve always had this concept that he wanted his racing movie that he would eventually make to be authentic. It had to be a film that his racing buddies would appreciate. That is a clip from the Sky documentary, Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie. And this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, a London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. Today we're in for a special treat as we talk about the Hollywood icon Steve McQueen, his passion for motor racing, and his long-lost Formula One film project that never saw the light of day, until now that is. Joining us to talk about this incredible story are the filmmakers behind Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie, director, writer, and producer Alex Roger, and archivist Richard Weissman. Alex and Richard, welcome to Factual America. How are you doing, Alex? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having us on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Richard, how are things with you? Very good. Very, very good. Very pleased to share, uh, to share my very well-organized uh, library of books behind me with the world here. I think that, is that really your room or is that just one of those things they put on you behind, behind yeah, you on Zoom to make it? Yeah, I got this set, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, the, the film is Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie. Um, so as Damien Smith at Motorsport Magazine put it, uh, for anyone with even a passing interest in motor racing, it should be judged unmissable. Uh, released at the beginning of the year on Sky and Now TV. Is it anywhere else? Uh, we've got listeners in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, do you know where it's showing elsewhere? Uh, it's not currently anywhere else. Hopefully it will be soon. Um, hopefully it'll be out in, on NBC in America at some point, but at the minute it's just in the U.K. Okay. Well, we'll keep everyone posted on that. Um, so thanks again so much for coming onto the podcast. Um, and um, just want to say it's... Um, I mean, it's, I had a lot of fun watching this. It's one, personally, it's one of my favorite time periods, uh, which I think you've captured very elegantly with uh, certainly all that archival footage. And then I, I don't usually struggle with this, but where do we begin? I mean, there's so many storylines here. There's Steve McQueen, which is extremely cool. There's uh, 1960s F1 racing, which is just about as cool, I think. Uh, the, the film chronicles a race between two identical films. You've got iconic directors and film studios battling out. Uh, never before seen racing footage, which uh, hold tight for those of you who are on uh, YouTube. And if you're listening, we'll check out the YouTube feed later. Uh, it's definitely worth uh, a, a watch. And uh, the story behind the story of this film, David Letterman even narrates. So um, I don't know, but maybe we can start, Alex, with, uh, give us a little background. What is sort of, what is the synopsis of this film? Uh, well, you've, you've, you've captured quite a lot of it. And the, the synopsis is, um, <clears throat> after The Great Escape in 63, McQueen had, his star power was just out of control. He basically had the power to do anything he wanted in Hollywood. And what he really wanted to do was make a movie about Formula One uh, racing. Uh, we, everyone knows that he was a, a huge motor racing fan and his passion was cars and bikes, but he wanted to make a film about authentic uh, European style, single seater car racing. So <clears throat> he went, he went about um, trying, trying to do that with uh, John Sturgis, who of course he'd worked with on The Great Escape. Um, and it's the our, our documentary is the story of him trying to get that film made alongside the rivalry that he had with um, James Garner and John Frankenheimer, who were trying to make the same film based on the same book and they were making it for MGM, whereas McQueen and Sturgeon were trying to make it for Warner Brothers. 
and we chronicle the um, trials and tribulations of how that all came about and the ups and downs of, of that storyline, really. Okay. And, and Richard, I know, um, um, I mean, maybe you could tell us a little more about McQueen's connections to motor racing. I know you were the uh, archive producer on the Steve McQueen, the man in Le Mans doc in 2016. Uh, he wasn't just a playboy or wannabe, was, uh, was he? No, absolutely not. In actual fact, one of the um, one of the, the themes that's quite key to the sort of first part of our documentary is the fact that McQueen was such a massive petrol head and was aware of the fact that um, the sport was far more well developed in Europe and had much more of a European history than it did in America. And so he actually agreed to make this war film, this rather ropey war film actually, <laughs> in England called yeah. The War Lover purely because he discovered that the location work was being done in a, in a county here called Norfolk. And he recognized Norfolk as being the location of the Jim Russell race driving school at Snetterton. Um, and so he realized that, you know, not only can I have a, a nice payday and a, and a long trip to England, but also in all my time offset, I can learn how to be a professional European racing driver. Yeah, I think, and you've got some great footage of that, of that racing uh, school in, in Norfolk. And uh, even I think there's some great stories too about his time in England, uh, skiving off from the film, trying to, you know, to get some uh, driving in. Um, Alex, I mean, tell us about Formula One racing in the 1960s. You've sort of alluded to it already with that book, but uh, maybe you can tell us, you know, certainly in contrast to what it's like now. I mean, in the 60s, it was unbelievably dangerous i mean way more than you can fathom now i mean we've had a couple of yeah. tragic deaths obviously in the last in the last few years but um in in those days it was five six drivers a season would lose their lives i mean it was unbelievably um unbelievably dangerous and he he saw that as um as as a way into the drama and the and the um, story of, of Formula One and how he could bring that to the screen that was definitely an element that he felt needed to be told and, and these guys these guys were proper gladiators in the 60s I mean they were basically sitting sitting in a fuel tank the fuel was all around them in these cars as they were driving around these circuits that had no runoff areas no proper barriers no real safety equipment like you see today I mean it was an unbelievably different world um, but that was that was an element that he, that he thought he really needed to capture. Um, yeah. And this book that they both tried to make the film from, um, The Cruel Sport by Robert Daly, really brought uh, that danger and that deathly aspect to, to the masses mm -hmm. in a way that the press hadn't really done so far. Um, especially the English press were quite, um, they sanitized the sport quite a lot. They'd mentioned a driver's death, but maybe only a couple of lines. It wasn't really a big headline but he he saw that that was a, a feature that should should be brought to the, the general public really yeah and at the same time it was sort of the glory days of british racing from the standpoint of the number of british racers that were at on the podium wasn't it oh yeah there was jim yeah. clark there was um sterling moss there was uh jackie stewart and graham hill there was a, a whole a whole list of um of great great drivers that emerged from that period that we still talk about today i mean tragically um, most of them aren't around anymore. We lost, uh, we lost um, Sterling Moss in 2020, but thankfully Jackie Stewart is, is still with us. And so we were very lucky to be able to interview him for our documentary. Yeah. And Richard, uh, listeners will know about, uh, well, this rival film, Grand Prix, um, and then eventually um, uh, Steve McQueen did make a racing film, uh, Le Mans. But... Uh, what about the day of the champion? I mean, you, I think you've, uh, I think Alex already mentioned it, talked about it a little bit, but what's, what's the backstory here? If you could provide a little bit more of that. I think the backstory is that McQueen wanted to make a film on motor racing. Um, and as Alex said, after the great escape, he, he had the, uh, the, the muscle, the star power, the juice, as he called it, basically to get anything that he wanted made. He wanted to make a motor racing movie. He wanted it to be directed by John Sturges. Because yeah. um, John Sturges, in addition to being a, a terrific filmmaker, um, was also famous, whether it was in westerns or in war movies like The Great Escape, for, for being able to put together really convincing looking action scenes. Yeah, and uh, he was sort of a pioneer in terms of action movies, wasn't he? Um, well, it's unusual. If you think of The Great Escape, um, it's, a, it's a war movie, it's an escape movie, but it's an action movie as well. 
Um, and one of the things that I think really bonded Sturges and McQueen together was that originally um, the, the motorbike chase sequence and the, the jumping over the barbed yeah. wire and everything wasn't in the script. Um, and McQueen felt that his character in that movie really didn't have an identity. And mm. so it really was a case of them making it up as they went along. But, you know, as with things like uh, Casablanca, sometimes that can happen on set with the script being changed every day and scenes changing. Mm. And the end result ends up really well. Uh, yeah. That was the opposite of what happened with Le Mans. They were <laughs> changing the script and making up new scenes every day and it didn't work, arguably, in the end. I mean, I think you, even in this, this doc, you even make reference to the fact that there was more, uh, well, there's this debate, was this battle between even Sturgis and, and uh, McQueen wasn't there in terms of Sturgis wanted the story with racing as the backdrop and McQueen wanted the racing with story maybe as a backdrop. Is well, that... that was certainly the case on Le Mans. I think on Day of the Champion, it being 65, 66, it predates Bullet and the Thomas Crown Affair. Yeah. So McQueen is a massive bankable star male lead off the back of the Great Escape, but he hasn't yet got to the point where he's the biggest Hollywood movie star in the world by a mile. And so I mm. think Day of the Champion had it been made would have been more of a conventional movie. But, you know, as Alex will tell you, because Alex has read the script, it might be oh, wow. that it wasn't made, actually, because the script isn't brilliant. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, I mean, Alex, uh, I mean, I... I didn't even think the title sounded that good, uh, but you've, you've, you've read the script. What would you say about it? I would agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty soap opera -y. I mean, a bit like Grand Prix, it's, I think it would have been spectacular to look at, but I don't think it would have been much of a, of a movie. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite cliched. It's swinging 60s, it's pretty girls. It's, it's kind of all the stuff you'd, you'd expect. Um, but I think Sturgis would have brought a real visual flair to it, um, yeah. as we as we saw with with the footage that we've managed to yeah. that Richard that Richard managed to find and, and get in our documentary. It would have looked amazing, but I don't think it would have been. Uh, I don't think it would have enhanced his career as a movie star like the Thomas Crown Affair or Bullet or Sam Pebbles did. Right, right. I think, um, and and further on that, I mean, and we'll we'll get talking about this footage uh, shortly, actually, uh, but. Uh, the film also documents 1960s Hollywood, I think, quite well. It's very interesting. You've got, as you've already said, Warner Brothers versus MGM. You've got John Sturgis versus Frank, John Frankenheimer, so the Battle of the Johns. You've got uh, Sturgis already had uh, Gunfight at OK Corral, Magnificent Seven, Great Escape Under His Belt. I mean, amazing. Frankenheimer, Birdman of Alcatraz, Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, and others. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. The... The, the 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 direct you know the directors we're talking about um, so what I found interesting is uh, maybe you can set this up too Alex is that uh, I mean the, they were just and I know you have experience with uh, F1 filming and stuff I mean uh, how did you know they were stepping on each other's toes at Monaco I mean this just sounds crazy what was going on yeah it would have been total chaos I mean as we allude to in the in the film. Monaco is tiny anyway, like there's not many places to stand even if you're meant to be there, let alone if you're doing a recce or you're kind of just walking around seeing where positions might, might be good to shoot from. And especially when Frankenheimer got there in 66 to shoot, to shoot Grand Prix and to shoot the actual race and to stage his own race, I mean, it would have been carnage. I mean, there's no, there's no chance that would happen today. It, was just, it wouldn't happen in a million years. Um, but it was way less regulated back in 66 and they could kind of just come in and do what they want. You know, they paid formula one for access. So they, they just went in and did, and did, did their business. Um, but yeah, it would have, it would have been total chaos. So I think that takes us to uh, a, a point here where we'll, we'll take a little early break if you don't mind. And we'll watch one of the uh, other clips that you've shared with us um, about this incredible um, making of this film that never got, scene basically um alex maybe you can um introduce this uh, introduce this clip it's about uh, them sort of filming at nurburgring the old course and in uh in panavision uh yeah so i think in this clip um uh, we talk about the the aspect ratio that they wanted to shoot the film in and how uh shooting it in um really widescreen brings you much more into the kind of the frame and the visor of of how um, a racing driver would see would see the track, and I think in this clip, Peter Windsor is discussing um, 
the ins and outs of how they put the cameras on the cars. And I think he alludes back to a, an accident that Graham Hill had there in 1962. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, listen, or for those of you on YouTube, let's watch, and we'll be right back with uh, Alex and Richard. Explicitly used Panavision, not just any old Panavision, but we shot it in a 235 ratio, meaning the screen, the shape of the frame is 2.35 times as wide as it is tall. It's called Panavision Anamorphic, and that gives you the shape you want for a motor racing film because you are certainly, you know, wider than a regular 185 television kind of shape of frame. It's interesting to remember that they then stayed at the Nürburgring and filmed the week after that race, ostensibly to test the camera mounts they were going to put on the cars. And, and that's where Alan Mann came in. Obviously, the design of the camera mounts was going to be part of his uh, brief. And this has to be seen against the 62 accident at the Nürburgring in practice. Graham Hill had a camera on the BRM and it came off and he had a big shunt, very big shunt, very lucky to get away with his life in that accident. So here we are long before onboard cameras even became a phrase. We have Warner Brothers with Alan Mann, with John Whitmore and Sterling Moss hiring the Nürburgring, the 14 mile circuit. Some of the footage we see is an indication of how good that was and how good it would have been. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Alex Roger and Richard Weissman. Uh, the film we're talking about is Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie. It's on Sky and Now TV in the UK, and it will be available elsewhere in the not-too-distant future. Uh, Adam Sweeting at artsdesk.com says, Director Alex Roger has assembled a fascinating and frequently thrilling documentary bristling with treasurable archive footage and resonant with famous names. Now, we've just seen this incredible footage. Uh, that I have to say, um, I mean, my, when I saw this, it was just, wow. I mean, you know, it, it takes a lot to impress children these days. I showed it to mine, and they were, they were pretty blown away themselves. And then when I start telling them and they start showing them how they've made these films, uh, even more so. Um, Richard, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about all these things, but Richard, maybe you can tell us a, a little bit more about the, the background between uh, some of this no, never seen before, um, never before seen footage, I should, should say. Uh, there's a few stories about how you found this and came across it. Uh, yeah, well, I'd love to say that this was all down to my deeply brilliant expertise, but I actually tripped over it whilst I was looking for something else. Um, I was working on a documentary uh, a year or so ago about Max Mosley, who used to be president of the International Motor Racing Federation. Yeah. And in a previous life, he'd been a racing driver of the late 60s, and he'd given a particular interview answer talking about driving at the Nürburgring. Um, and so I was asked, and in fact, I was sent some stock footage to look at from a commercial library um, of a 1960s racing driver on the Nürburgring. And I looked at it and I thought, I think I know where that is. And I think I know where that's from. I didn't know that that existed. It shouldn't really exist. Yeah. And the next thing I did was, um, I won't tell you the name of the library, but it's a large commercial library. I rang up my contact there and said, um, can you license this? And he <laughs> said, well, yeah, it's on our system. It's, uh, you know, it's in some full public view. Um, you know, I, I could write you a license now for global you know, distribution, if you like. I said, <laughs> Okay, hold that thought. I might yeah. come back to you on that. Yeah. And then I basically had to go away. It was very useful when we met um, Offside Sports Photography, who has the, the Jerry Cranham um, still photography collection. Mm. Because as you'll see, as, as Alex did in those sequences, when he was bat and balling the footage with the black and white onset photos, right. that confirmed that what I thought it was, it was. Because mm. when you've got a black and white photo with a clapperboard saying day of the champion, yeah. and then immediately you've got that scene in color on color film. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. And then we had the whole business of, okay, well, we found this and we think it's interesting and exciting. Um, is there a, a TV channel that would like to make a documentary out of this? 
Mm. And that was made trickier by the fact that obviously the first question that they asked was, is Steve McQueen in this? Is he driving any of the cars? To which yeah. the answers were no and no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but this isn't, I mean, it, correct me if I'm wrong, this isn't the first time you've sort of stumbled over uh, brushes or dailies that people didn't know exist. Is that correct? I mean, wasn't that true with some of the other uh, motor racing docs you've worked on? Uh, it's more true in the other McQueen documentary that I worked on, Steve McQueen, The Man in Le Mans. Yeah. Um, so I've made two McQueen discoveries, and to a certain extent, they've both been flukes. Um, the first one, The Man in Le Mans, I, I sort of tracked down the last place that I knew the film had been edited or I, I thought I knew where the film reels were, which is a place called Culver City, I think, if you've ever heard of that. Yeah, it's outside of LA, isn't it? Yeah, and so this yeah. was one of the few sort of um, editing facilities or sort of um, movie production pieces of property that hadn't been bulldozed in the last 50 years. So mm. I rang them up and I kind of got hold of the, the storekeeper and I said, can you have a look at this most ridiculous question ever? Can you have a look and see if there are any boxes on the shelves that have Le Mans written on them? <laughs> and then three or four days later, I thought, what have I done? What have I done? That's the dumbest question you could possibly ask. They're probably yeah. laughing at me, you know? Yeah. And then I got an email saying, um, under a sound stage, we've found 400 boxes with Le Mans written on them and they're all covered in dust. Um, so this one wasn't quite as sexy. This was seeing something on a publicly available website, but you had to know where to look. And then you had to be able to recognize the importance of what you were seeing because it was filed as being stock library stuff. Mm. And um, I mean, is it also correct? Because, uh, you know, because you, you do some Googling and stuff. I mean, supposedly Frankenheimer also filmed at Nürburgring and then had to turn the... I mean, is, is any of that available or as uh, I'm sure you looked? Uh, well, we, on, this was on the Man Lamar about five years ago. We managed to make contact with um, John Frankenheimer's daughter, who's now a production manager in Hollywood. And mm -hmm. she said, um, no, um, we haven't got anything. So far as we know, there's nothing. And in actual fact, what's one of the things that's interesting is that the circuits that Day of the Champion filmed at, Nürburgring being obviously the, the, the biggest and most visible example, mm. those circuits aren't in Grand Prix. Mm. So I think there was an exclusive location agreement with, with Day of the Champion and Sturges. And yeah, yeah, it is possible that Frankenheimer had to hand his reels over. But, um, you know, that's, that's a further documentary altogether. <laughs> okay. Um, and Alex, I mean, how... Uh, when you came when you were first shown this, I mean, how amazing is that footage? And and if you can put into context what they were able to achieve with 1960s technology. Oh, it's absolutely astonishing. I mean, this is before the phrase onboard cameras had even been invented, right? Yeah. So they, what I can get over is how steady it is. It doesn't, it doesn't exactly. move at all. Yeah. And even now, it's kind of you know a little bit wobbly and shaky when you watch mm. modern modern Formula One. It's absolutely astonishing how how um, how stable it all is and how well secured the cameras are to the to the chassis of these cars. And yeah, I mean, I had when we first kind of started doing this, I had this grand idea about trying to recreate it and going to the Nurburgring and taking a, an old '60s car out and trying to sort of recreate some of this stuff. But I mean, <laughs> COVID yeah, got insurance in wouldn't let you, I think. Well, insurance uh, wouldn't let us, money wouldn't let us, COVID wouldn't let us. So you know, yeah. the non-starter from it's not non-starter right from right from the get-go. But it would have been fascinating to try to recreate what they did all those years ago. And I don't think probably we would have got anywhere near it. I mean, I don't, the engineering was, was absolutely top class. And, and luckily we were able to talk to the, the race team that we're going to, that we're going to prep the cars for the film, uh, Alan Mann racing. Yeah. They're still going and they're run by his, his son, Henry Mann. Mm. Uh, so we were able to, to get in there and, and understand what, what they were trying to do before it all got pulled. Okay. Well, why don't we see one more clip? Because I think that that clip and listen to it, because the audio is also really good on this, that talks a little bit more about some of this. Uh, I think you get a picture. There's some more footage in there showing, uh, I mean, amazing things. You got guys strapped in a chair, essentially, on the front of a racing car, you know, going full, full speed. Uh, even the... Um, even on the Grand Prix of Frankenheimer's film, they've got like these massive cameras just right off, you know, right there at James Gardner's head and he's going around the streets of Monte Carlo. So uh, we've got this one more clip. Uh, Richard, why don't you help set that up for us? Okay, so I believe that this is, um, actually the guy that you were talking about strapped in the chair 
yeah. um, was David Samuelson, one of the Samuelson brothers who effectively invented Panavision. And it was Panavision technology that was used on both Day of the Champion and Lamar. And I believe that the voice you're gonna hear is, is Peter Samuelson, yeah. who I, I think from memory would have been his nephew, who's been a film producer in LA for the past 30 or 40 years. So it's plainly in the blood with the Samuelson family. Okay, well, let's uh, watch and listen to that clip now. And they're still in the camera car. You had a 400 foot roll of film, so you had about four minutes uh, in each go, and then you had to reload, because uh, this was obviously, you know, decades before uh, there was digital. So we were on 35 millimeter Eastman color. Samuelson Film Service was run by four brothers, uh, three of whom were my uncles, and one was my dad. And uh, David was the technical partner and he was responsible for all manner of extraordinary bits of brand new, never been thought of before technology. And a number of his things are still used. He built some of it for Day of the Champion. That is a, a racing car flat out, and all you can see around it is green, nothing else. The carousel. I mean, it was a wonderful racetrack. It was a terrific racetrack, but crazy. You know, 14.7 miles, 187 corners per lap. Yeah, it was a great race in so many ways. This is the race in which Jim Clark clinched the 65 World Championship. It's just amazing footage to have seen it after all this time. There's Jimmy after the race, and uh, the mechanics running. That's real film, it's just... Amazing. And what a, what a trio on the podium. Jim Clark in the middle, Dan Gurney, Graham Hill. Doesn't get much better than that in terms of the drivers he had to beat. And then for Jim Clark, at that moment, he's driving off in the Merc, and he's just won his second world championship. In the same year, he's won the Indy 500. No driver will ever do that. So, I mean, that's just some more incredible footage there. Uh, and as I said, even, you know, even my... Children were we're so impressed by by this and what these you know people their grandfather's age were doing back in the sixties and uh, to to bring this uh, bring this to life. Um, well, I, I think we should make the point if we could that um, you know plainly um, you only have to look at the calendar to see that this is forty fifty years before CGI. Um, mm. So if you wanted to film racing cars driving at 150 miles an hour, you had to film racing cars driving at 150 <laughs> miles an hour and think of a way of putting cameras in and on them that wouldn't break and fall off, uh, you know, using just the technology that was available at the time. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a very good point to make. And I actually have a, a, a follow up on that that I want to go to later because I think it's, it speaks to something. It also speaks to that era. But uh, you were you kind of uh, before probably I uh, rudely uh, uh, interrupted you, but uh, I think even before the break. But Richard talking about how you know finding this uh, this footage and trying to get a TV uh, a commissioner to 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 run with this. Yet you don't have any. Unfortunately, you don't have any footage of McQueen behind the wheel. Um, so what what happened next? And uh, you know how do you how do you get uh, Sky on board and Alex involved? Um, well, I've known Alex for about eight or nine years now because we both worked on the launch of, of Sky Sports F1. Um, okay. but I, I've worked in, in documentaries uh, outside uh, motor racing or even sport. Um, I've worked on things like um, the undiscovered Peter Cook and the okay. unseen Peter Sellers. And Excellent. in those kind of entertainment or film themed docs, I've worked for an executive producer called Victor Lewis Smith who was a very well-known writer and satirist over here. And he called me about this time last year and said, um, I've got this opportunity of, of, of a meeting with Sky Documentaries um, because Victor had made um, three very successful documentaries for Sky Arts the year before. Mm. Um, and he said, um, have you got anything? You know, it's always good to discuss three or four options with them because if we discuss yeah. three or four, they might like one. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm aware of where this unseen, unmade Steve McQueen footage is, but it doesn't have Steve McQueen in it. 
And he said, is there enough of a story for us to make something around it? And I said, yeah, I think there is. And then he later asked me, he said, well, I can't think of a director for this. Do you know anyone? It needs to be someone that's good on sport and knows, you know, how to, how to put a story together. Yeah. I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll introduce you to Alex. Okay. Well, and, and, and great that you did. I mean, Alex, um, um, well, one, this all ha- this, let me correct me because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but uh, putting two and two together and I'm gathering this all was done under COVID. Is that right? Yeah, it was. Um, absolutely. Um, I mean, I owe uh, Richard many crates of red wine for, for introducing me to Victor and getting me on this project. Um, so, yeah, w- he introduced us last um, April, maybe. So just as the lockdown was really starting to mm. uh, kick in and we were all kind of just sitting in our living rooms waiting for the phone to ring sort of thing. Um, but we started making it in middle of June once we got uh, the commission and we knew what we were trying to trying to do with it and yeah it was basically all made un- under covid i mean i was yeah. sitting here at my desk in my in my living room um writing the scripts and um we did manage to as the restrictions eased we managed to get out and, mm. in, and interview people and i was able to meet up with my editor um right. but socially distanced of course um but it was it was tough i mean you know obviously mm. we'd have liked to have gone to more places and spoken to more people um, got access to more things and more footage and more places and traveled a bit more and shot a bit more actuality. It would have been great to have gone to the Nürburgring or to Monaco yeah, or yeah. Um, even come to America and um, mm-hmm. talk to people from the Boys Republic or people that knew him, him more in America. Uh, but I just, that, just wasn't, that just wasn't possible last year. Well, can I give you, I mean, my congratulations because I, I do some work with uh, uh, Elmo Pictures and some getting a little introduced to this world. And I know about the, is the time you're talking about, April, everyone was saying the exact same thing. What's well, all, you know, let's concentrate on archival. Uh, that's the, you know, you guys actually did it. Cause I mean, everyone's talking <laughs> about it, but no one, I mean, you are the first film that we've had on that did all its filming under COVID. In fact, I will say, I don't know if we had one. There, there were some that obviously went into, po- did post-production under yeah, COVID, yeah. but everything up before post-production was done pre-COVID. So this is, this is absolutely amazing. You, it shows you what you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that, those kind yeah. words. Yeah, it was, it was start to finish in 2020. It was, it was June to end of November last year. So it was yeah, right in the middle of when all the restrictions were at their highest, really. And then with that, all that in mind, and as uh, Richard was already saying, you, you know, need a director with some, uh, a, you know, writing background and you've got a, you can craft a story. How did you go about, you know, crafting the story? Because, you, you know, you got to, I, I don't know how much the sum total of, of the rushes or dailies are that we see in the film, but that's not a, necessarily enough to hang your hat on. You need no, to. I mean, all, all of you, them are up there. They're, 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 yeah, exactly. we, didn't, we didn't waste a frame, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, we knew we had about four or five elements. We had the lost footage, we had the black and white Cranham photos, we had the mm. script, and we had the Warner Brothers uh, memos. Yeah. Um, so we knew we had those elements to, to, to package the story around. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we got very lucky with the Allen Man Racing Company. Um, and they had kept everything they'd ever received, oh, every wow. correspondence from yeah. Solar Pictures and Brookwood Pictures and, and Sturgis and Sterling Moss every telegram, every bill, every invoice they'd ever got, they still had. So we were able to piece together the timeline of this, of this project and know how all the other bits fitted in around the sand pebbles and Sturgis going off to do I Station Zebra and, um, and where uh, the meetings with um, Frankenheimer and Eddie Lewis um, mm-hmm. happened. So we were able to piece it all together like that and then uh, kind of, got shot the interviews to, to, to fill in, fill in the blanks maybe and, and fit in the gaps. Um, but that's where Richard's involvement was priceless again, of course, because he found the interview with, uh, Frankenheimer, right. Which was shot in 98. Is that right, Richard? Yeah. Yeah. 98. And that's what gave us the story about him meeting Enzo Ferrari mm. and, and all that kind of stuff. So th- there are a lot of blanks that got filled in by archive interviews as well as talking to our modern day contributors. You know that, and and you mentioned Peter Sellers already, uh, Richard. What I, now? I'm now I'm reminded what those uh, memos reminded me of because you've got the Warner Brothers movie uh, memos. There's this doc that came out about uh, this mo- another movie that never got, or 
didn't see the light of day for many decades was this Peter Sellers movie that he made. I forget get the name of it, but it came out uh, oh, about a year ago, I think. That and was the pirate movie that he was making with Spike Milligan, right? Yeah, exactly. And they Directed and that by Peter Medak. Yes. Never quite recovered from it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they do the same thing. They've got all the they've got all these memos or or sort of budget notes, you know, and the and the producers back in London saying you're spending this too much money, you know, too much money. And it they kind of do something similar. You know, you see the memos go up on screen and they kind of uh you you know it get voiceover or whatever, but you get a feel for the sort of the some of the tensions and things that were were going on and they're quite uh um so that, yeah that's very uh it's very interesting i mean and speaking of never re recovering um richard i mean is it i mean it's kind of alluded to or maybe more than alluded to in, in your film but uh i mean i was going to ask you is there anything new about steve mcqueen that you learned in this whole process but it's it strikes me that this uh not getting this film made um really haunted him for the seems like for the rest of his life well it's interesting that when he had the star power coming off the back of Bullet and the Thomas Crown Affair. Yeah. Um, I think it was said, you know, previously uh, that on, on the back of those two, if Hollywood had wanted him to make a movie about the, the telephone directory, they'd have said, how much money do you want and where can we sign? Yeah. When the precise moment when he had that almost insane level of star power, he wanted to make another motor racing movie, the definitive motor racing movie to put Grand Prix and James Garner in its place. Yeah. And in actual fact, in the final part of the, uh, of the documentary, I think we sort of try and explain that in some detail um, and how he, he almost defeated himself trying mm. to outdo Frankenheimer and Garner and, and actually to an extent what was gonna be his first motor racing movie. And also how some of the script lines, like the line that everyone remembers from Le Mans, um, you know, uh, uh, everything else is just waiting. Yeah, was originally a line that was a script line that was in Day of the Champion. Yeah, and uh, so he, he just just almost couldn't let go. I mean, I think he was so. I mean, that's that's the amazing thing is you document. I mean, we don't try to discuss the films too much in detail because you know spoil alerts and all that stuff, and people should definitely watch it. But uh, uh, you know, I mean, these th this, these incredible uh, decisions of about whether to to go ahead and continue with the film or not. And, you know, all that they've invested in it and uh, then to be told, no, that's it, shut down production. Yeah, I mean, they'd already spent like four and a half million dollars on, on mm -hmm. going around and shooting at various races. And that's, that's $20 million today. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many recent movies have got pulled having already spent $20 million, but I can't imagine it's too many. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was a huge labor of love for him. And I think we try to put a slightly new context on, on Le Mans by, by referencing what, what came from yeah. the champion and went into Le Mans. Yeah. As Richard said, there's the, there's that line of racing as life. Everything else is just waiting, which comes from the original daily champion script. And also stuff like his name, like he, he's called Mike, um, Mike Pierce in, um, in day of the champion and Mike Delaney, of course, in Le Mans. So even his name was very, very similar. Yeah. So he, he was, he was still really hung up on, on the failure of Day of the Champion, and that drove him, I think, to 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 really want to make Le Mans to the best of his ability. And Alex, so you get uh, David Letterman to narrate, uh, do voiceover. Certainly, how did you how did you manage that? Well, that came about through through Victor, who was our um, executive producer. He, as Richard mentioned, he he was a, a satirist and writer here in the UK, and he'd done. Richard might be able to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but he'd done some writing for the Howard Stern radio show uh, oh, really? many, many years ago. Yeah. Uh, so he had an in uh, through Howard Stern through to, to, to Letterman in, in some way. And, and we just kind of, we thought it was a bit of a pie in the sky email, just trying to think, you know, he, he'd be amazing to, to, to do the narration for this. Cause we knew he was a motorsport fan yeah. anyway, cause he, he, he owns a, a motorsport team. We knew he was a big fan of Jim Clark, who features heavily in our in our movie, um, and, a, and a big fan of Formula One. So we thought this is this would be great, um, and we sent him about an eight or nine minute um, clip of the of the film as it was then, with some of the some of the lost footage in it, and some of some of the journalists we thought he would know. Uh, he knew of Nigel Roebuck and Peter Windsor, mm. and after seeing that, he yeah he jumped at it, and it was a great it was a great day when we got that email saying I'm in. 
because um, we knew because <laughs> we knew it would <laughs> it would elevate the documentary just by having his name attached to it and also it gave us kind of an air of authenticity um that that we felt we needed we didn't we didn't want a big grandiose dramatic voiceover it wouldn't it wouldn't mm. have felt right so having yeah. someone like him who's from indianapolis loves motorsport yeah. loves yeah. mcqueen and is kind of involved in that in that world we just felt it gave us a an air of authenticity that sits really well in the film yeah no i think it's it's excellent is there any ch- are there any challenges in trying to do that all remotely or is that kind of the way it would have been done anyway well i think it probably would have been done remotely anyway but i it was weird. I couldn't even see him. So I'm trying to direct him. I'm just basically just doing it over zoom and I can't see him at all. Like even yeah. now we, we can play off each other. So we can see each other a little bit. So you get body language and stuff, but yeah. I couldn't even see him. So that was, that was a challenge, but he, he was, he was great. I mean, he gave us everything yeah. we wanted. He didn't, he didn't mind doing things again and again. If you know, we needed to f- take half a second out of something to make it fit a gap. He was very yeah. happy to do it. Yeah. He was, he was a joy to work with. He was great. Yeah. And it should help you raise the profile when it does finally release in the, in the US. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I should possibly add something here, which is that, um, and you'll know this better than me, having grown up in America, that um, when he was doing Late Night with Lesserman on NBC after Johnny Carson, um, Lesserman didn't used to have an opening monologue. And then when he moved to CBS and had his own show there, uh, the first five or six minutes of his show were, were his opening monologue and topical gags. Yeah. And I, I, I'd known Victor for nearly 20 years. And it was only after I'd known him for about 15 years, he casually let me know that he used to write some of the um, topical gags for Dave's opening monologues. Wow. And that obviously helped to strengthen the connection, knowing the fact that, that Lesserman's a, a massive most racing fan as well. Yeah. But it's amazing. Oh, okay, there you go. Use that, use that bit in the edit then, because I got it wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, we may even leave it in. i mean it's a it's a podcast you can uh it's a little rough and ready when it when it as these things go but uh no i think um i mean that's i mean i grew up a, a huge letterman fan uh you know growing up in the u.s and uh uh but yeah you, you knew he liked his racing well he also made it in the news every now and then when he uh, go a little bit faster than he should and get yeah. caught by the uh uh, Connecticut uh, Highway Patrol or whoever it was. Uh, so uh, I remember yeah. Hillary Clinton accusing him of possessing a heavy right foot. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that episode of um, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee that he's done with with Jerry Seinfeld, where he's got the the, the his brilliant the Vol, the big Volvo station wagon, right. but it was built for him by Paul Newman, and it's got like a V12 racing engine in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just ridiculous. This family car that can go about 200 miles an hour. It's brilliant. <laughs> and there's also a weird circle of life there because Jerry Seinfeld owns the Porsche that uh, Steve McQueen drove in Le Mans. The Porsche 917, the golf colored one. Jerry Seinfeld bought it. He bought it. Wow. Yeah. That is a circle of life. That's yeah. uh, because even doing, you know, not to get too much, but I was doing, you know, getting prepped for this and my, uh, you know, teenage daughter comes in, what are you doing, dad? And I'm showing her and then that, oh, I'll do a quick Google search. And that, that came up. That was like one of the first images that came up. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. You know, even, even, even these kids uh, these days are impressed. Um, I mean, the other thing that's, uh, one thing that strikes me about this film, it's obviously you got Steve McQueen. Uh, we've got David Letterman. We've got 60s Hollywood and all this stuff going on. But um if you don't mind me saying so, as someone who's lived here a while, um, in some ways, this is a quintessential British movie. <laughs> and I mean that in the best way possible. I really do. I mean, I think, because what we were talking about, and this is what I was alluding to when I said a follow-up, you were talking about this engineering and what they did with the cameras and the cars and what they, I mean, that is, that is a testimony to British engineering in that era. You know, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And for people who don't live here, you, I mean, this place is full of dotted with, the landscape's dotted with like steam rail, repli- you know, steam railway places. And I used to live in Hertfordshire and there's the De Havilland Aircraft Museum and you go visit these places and there's these guys, they're a dying breed, but of that generation who would be there having their cups of tea, all retired, but banging metal and restoring all these cars and airplanes and, uh, locomotives and um, quite a quite amazing generation that was. Well, th- there's a theory as to kind of why the national psyche, um, because Britain's still the centre of, of Formula One, 
yeah. um, the majority of the teams are from here. And it is said that um, uh, British engineers in particular are good at long periods of concentration and specialist manufacturing and everything else. What we're not very good at in this country is mass production. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, yeah. it harks back to the war as well, doesn't it? When you, you had to build stuff that wasn't going to break, because if it broke, you'd, you, you're dead, basically. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Spitfires and the Hurricanes and all that kind of amazing engineering then bled through to when they didn't have warplanes to build, what were they going to build next? Well, we might, let's build some great racing cars. Yeah. And I think that passion for speed and engineering and, and, um, and getting stuff getting stuff done that was going to work was, was very much bled through into, into motor racing of that, of that era. And as Richard said, it's, it's continues to this day, you know, motor racing, sorry, Britain is the home still of, of formula one and, and motor racing. So it's, it's, it has never really gone away. I don't think. And I was going to say, it was also the, I have to care if we phrase this, but in some ways that was the peak of uh, British racing dominance, as we've already alluded to with all these amazing names that were, were, you know, Flying I think Lewis Hamilton Britain. might have something to say about yeah, well, it. <laughs> we are going to talk about Lewis Hamilton in a second here. Um, Sir, in terms, Sir Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. Thank you, these well, actually, yeah. that's, I, yeah, we have to say, I have to say Sir Lewis now. But, uh, um, I mean, I guess it's uh, part of the same idea. I mean, like you said, the, you know, Jim, Jimmy Clark's, Jackie Stewart, um, Graham Hill. I used to live nearby where he used to live way back. I mean, these are all, uh, I mean, what was it that what, what was there was there something in the water that you had so many of these guys um at the top of the game of the game back in the 60s do you want to take that one richard uh, well, i think it's probably got something to do with the fact that our domestic racing was probably the sort of best organized and most competitive in the world there, there were great drivers from france and italy and the usa mm. um but there was a specific kind of ladder into Formula One in this country where you could do more or less all your driving in this country. And because all the teams were based here, quite quickly end up in Formula One. Um, you know, if you're an Italian and Ferrari didn't want to take you on, that's obviously a that's lot a trickier. Point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and I was being charitable to, to Sir Lewis by calling that the peak of uh, British racing uh, dominance. Um, uh, but, you know, he's, uh, he's tied with Schumacher for most uh, World Drivers Championships, um, holds other records outright in terms of wins, uh, poles and podiums. Um, and, you know, some would say he's the, I guess that's that ongoing discussion, is he the greatest of all time? But uh, how do you think he would have fared in the 1960s going up against that lot? Would he have held his own? I'm, I'm sure you're going to say yes, but maybe you can... Maybe both of you have a, if you have an opinion on that. I think it's an impossible question, isn't it? I mean, you can't really compare yeah. eras with eras. I mean, you can't, it's, it's a fun game, but I don't think you can compare Schumacher with Fangio or Lewis yeah. with, Lewis with, um, with Jackie Stewart or Sterling Moss. Cause they're it's different cars, different eras, different, um, different levels of risk. I mean, he, he's a genius driver. There's, there's no, there's no denying that, but it's almost impossible to, to compare and contrast with previous eras, I think. But well, I've got a thought on this, which is I think Lewis will be a bit like Jackie Stewart in that his legacy will go above and beyond motor racing. Because in addition to being a brilliant driver, mm. it's Jackie who's responsible for introducing proper safety measures into the sport. And he's probably saved dozens of racing mm. drivers' lives through insisting on seat belts and crash barriers and everything else. Um, and I think Lewis's legacy will obviously be part of Black Lives Matter. Mm. Um, so I, I think, and I think he's already looking towards his legacy, his name beyond most racing, because to a certain extent, he's already conquered that. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. And then the parallels, I mean, I don't know how well, I don't know how well it's known or people are aware of in this country, but for me, I mean, Jackie Stewart is is as much a broadcaster as he is a car racer because I grew up watching, you know, every Memorial Day weekend, you watch the Indianapolis 500, who's there? It's Jackie Stewart. He also did, no, he was he did the Olympics. I think he did equestrian. He did, uh, you know, all kinds of winter, sport, you know, stuff way beyond um, race car driving. And I think it comes across, you've, you've got some great interview footage with him uh, in the movie. And, 
he's definitely, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but he's, not, he's more than just a racing car driver. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, I guess from your point of view, he was on ABC World of Sports, wasn't he, when, yeah. you, were, when you were growing up? Oh, he's wearing a um, yellow jacket, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he's, he's fantastic, and he's still, he's still incredibly uh, knowledgeable about the sport and gracious with his time, and he was really, really good to us. And we, when we asked to interview him, he, he let us come to his, his house here in England, and we, we went to his, 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 his barn. Mm-hmm. and um and interviewed him there and he he was great he remember he remembers everything like it was yesterday he's he's quite extraordinary for someone who's in their early 80s really yeah. i mean for those who uh, haven't seen the film yet i think what was also amazing was just him talking about these like the old course at nurburgring mm-hmm. i mean the number of curves in a in a 14.7 mile lap you know yeah uh turns i should say not curves um uh, also, what he says about Ma- uh, Monaco and number of gear changes <laughs> you had to go through in a lap. I mean, um, I thought it well, was... We should maybe make the point, Matthew, that, um, that the number of turns and the length of the course and everything were kind of seared into Jackie's brain because he memorized the Nürburgring, knowing that one tiny mistake um, would leave you coming out of there in a wooden overcoat, quite honestly. Um, because yeah. as you'll see from the footage... Have yeah. a look for crash barriers or spin-off zones. There aren't any. Um, if you get anything wrong, you're going to go into a tree at 160 miles an hour. Well, he called it a green hell, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's, uh, you're right. It's like you're going for a country drive, except you're going, whatever, 160 miles an hour or something in, a, in, a, in these ridiculous helmets. Like, how, would that have ever done anyone any good? These, you know, it, it's almost, for, it's almost uh, I don't know, for appearances' sake. That they're even... Sterling Moss's crash helmet it was literally a polo helmet. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, I kind of, what we were saying earlier, I mean, can you, you, can you even compare eras and can you even, and does your film say anything about the current state of racing or anything? Or you just, it's given that what the jumps in technology and everything, it's almost impossible to, to compare. Yeah, we didn't feel there was any point in trying to bring in modern racing into, into this film. It's very much a, a story of of that era and of and of McQueen, it would have felt um, rather incongruous, I think, to to yeah. brought Formula modern Formula One into it. And as you say, there's it's almost impossible to compare and contrast. It, it, yeah. it, there was there was really no point, and we felt yeah. we had to stick to we had to stick stay true to the story we were trying to tell of McQueen and the failure of Day of the Champion mm. um, to bring modern Formula One into it. There wasn't a lot of point to do that. I, didn't I, think. I think the one point that I'd like to make is that. Um, and I hope that this may prove more possible now with Liberty, an American media company owning Formula One. Mm. I'm sure that there are loads of movie studios and script writers and Alex is just one of the directors who could do it, who would love to, to, to make a Formula One themed movie about Formula One today. Oh, yeah. I think because... there's going to be one, isn't there? I think on, um, John Boyega and um, Robert De Niro are planning to do a film around Formula One. I think Formula One as the, as the backdrop, I think it's going to be like a mafia movie with John Boyega as a driver. But I, yeah, a contemporary F1 movie would be, would be fascinating these days, I think. That's a very good point because everything is backward looking, isn't it? It's all, you know, it, whether it's Docs, it's Senna or whoever, or it's, or, or Ford versus Ferrari, right? That was like... Uh, yeah, that was good fun. I thought that was yeah. brilliantly shot. That was, that was fantastically made. That was great fun. But you could take that, that ability to make that movie, and you, like you say, it was great fun, and then but put it in um, you know yeah. contemporary context. That's that's a very yeah very well, interesting idea. One of the idea. things that's, uh, that's been discussed previously, and I'd love to see it happen, is is kind of a a heist movie involving the casino at Monaco during <laughs> Monaco Grand Prix weekend. <laughs> see, I you guys, I, you you've already got all your your you've got your. Uh, your portfolio, you got your uh, list of, uh, <laughs> of films you're pitching. I can see it already. Uh, but in speaking of which, what is next for both of you? Um, Alex, so you got, what's next on the cards? Uh, it's a good question. I'm not too sure. I've got a few projects that I'm trying to get off the ground and a couple of things I'm trying to write, um, which I won't give you too much detail about now, but uh, hopefully there'll be <laughs> something coming up in the not too distant future. Um, but I still do, I still do live sports production as well. So I think I'll yeah. work on a few F1 races this year for, um, for F1 themselves, hopefully, and for Channel 4 and maybe Sky okay. here in the UK. Um, so, yeah, I'm still very much involved with, with modern-day uh, sports yeah. production as well. Okay. And, and Richard, I mean, as an archivist, I guess you're not hindered too much by, by COVID. I mean, what, what's next for you? 
it's been an incredibly busy 10 months. I'm sure there are a lot of people listening to this that will want to punch my lights out hearing that. But yeah, it's been nonstop work. Um, I'm presently working on the next series of um, Drive to Survive for Netflix, the Formula One themed Netflix series, which okay. is going to have a slightly stronger archive element to it. Yeah. Um, so if if you watch it and think, what's that nonsense from the 50s or 60s doing in here? That will probably be my fault. <laughs> okay. Well, I think, uh, I mean, it's hard to believe it. I think we're coming to the end of our time. And I uh, just wanted to uh, thank the both of you so much for coming on. Um, um, Alex and Richard, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I had a lot of fun watching this film. And so if, if uh, for you, for our listeners and uh, viewers here in the UK, if you haven't had a chance, do, um, do check out uh, Steve McQueen, The Lost Movie. It is on, um, we'll catch it while it's still on uh, Sky and Now TV. So uh, I, again, thank you so much for coming on. Really enjoyed having you. And uh, when you get your next film made, we'd love to have you on again if we haven't scared you off. <laughs> Not yeah. at all. Thanks for having us. It's been a real yeah. pleasure. All right. Well, I also want to give a uh, shout out to This Is Distorted Studios here in uh, Leeds, England. Also to our podcast manager, Nevin Apanovich, who ensures we continue getting such great guests as uh, Alex and Richard uh, to come onto the show. And a big thanks to our listeners. Um, We've built up quite an audience in a relatively short period of time, and we are quite thankful for your loyalty as well as your feedback, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. So keep the comments and episode ideas coming. It is very much appreciated. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.